Um, I'm Lily, and uh, I've been doing this crypto thing for a while now. Um, I uh, got interested in Bitcoin in 2013 when uh, that was probably the first time there was some news about it. And I thought, well, you know, I should look into this. And it's, it's either it's either a massive scam or it's massively interesting. Um, and it's nowhere in between. And so I uh, read the white paper. I'm not an engineer. So uh, initially I was like, you know, a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, but the more I got into it, the more I realized uh, that it's technically interesting, economically uh politically, geopolitically momentous. Um, and I think we're still very early. Uh, so I was in China at the time. Um, prior, I was in, you know, kind of more traditional finance, I suppose. I worked at McKinsey, worked at KKR, I was building hospitals in China for a number of years. And, uh, and then I came back to the US. Um, I met this guy, Balaji Srinivasan, who's, you know, written, spoken a lot in this space, uh, might have heard uh, some of the stuff that he's uh, talked about or written about um and we inherited this company called 21 which was a very successful uh, so we had we inherited this kind of 80 million dollar hole and had to dig ourselves out of that um and so uh we turned that into earn.com sold that to coinbase in 2018 uh and since then i've been doing various things um and more recently i've been pretty involved in cosmos through uh, osmosis I'm pretty involved with Solana, uh, Solana Foundation, and uh, and also continue to kind of invest in um, you know, just uh, do stuff across the space. So that's myself. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, that's fascinating. So so tell me about the the. So I'm curious um, in the projects you've been involved with. Um, obviously, since you you know stepped foot into the crypto world, what what kind of technologies have you seen kind of come and go? I'm, I'm curious about, you know, where some something like earn.com started to where, you know, some of the projects you're involved with now, if you want to share some of that for the audience, that'd be great yeah, to do what, you know, sure. some of the things you're working on. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, for myself, the motivation from the beginning of why getting into initially Bitcoin and then uh, we've called it various things, Bitcoin, blockchain, crypto, Web3, right, seems to be <laughs> more recent terminology. Um, uh, the reason why I got into it because I thought it was uh, interesting to sort of have um, modes of economic participation that centered more on the individual or smaller uh, communities rather than these sort of massive uh, nation state structures that we have today, right? And some of them function very well, but many of them do not. Uh, and a lot of the discussion that has been had in you know, academic, political, economic, country, you know, all sorts of different circles has always been sort of why, uh, why do some systems function very well and why are others extremely bad for the people that are part of them? Uh, and so, you know, there's been uh, basically unlimited amount of discussion on that topic, but I thought it was always an interesting one to think about, you know, what if you had more just direct individual access? what would that look like and how is that possible and you know what are the trade-offs um with that type of model so that's what always interested me about uh about crypto now how that relates to the technologies available um at you know when 2013 2014 and 2018 and now um there's been massive leaps and bounds forward i think uh and you know back when it was bitcoin uh only um the things that you could actually do with bitcoin were quite honestly, the applications related to Bitcoin were more imagined than feasible. So, you know, back in 2014, before it became assumed that Bitcoin is digital gold, there was thinking of Bitcoin being a payment network to challenge Visa and PayPal, right? And this whole idea of the billion, the billion transaction chain, that was the early uh, thinking around it. And then Bitcoin yeah. became digital yeah. gold. And now, I think the application space that would rely on something like that is still absolutely, I think, part of the dream, right? Um, but it's just not going to be done on Bitcoin. It's going to be done elsewhere. And I think the current candidate for where, let's call it a um, a blockchain-based instant payment network, uh, today it's almost certainly going to be uh, on Solana if you kind of consider the, the, the actors that we have. Great. And are some of the, are, are the projects you're involved with currently working working with uh, projects like Solana, other technologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh. So I work with Solana. I work with Osmosis. Um, and so, you know, I uh, uh, you know, we all kind of have our favorites, I suppose. Um, and in my mind, the general purpose blockchain um, that I think is just going to continue to crush it is Solana. 
Um, yes, there's been you know some challenges in recent weeks, um, but uh, every blockchain has had those. Um, every emerging technology has those. Uh, in blockchain, you just you know everything is out in the open, and so it looks more tumultuous. But that's really just because there's no sort of inside outside barrier that you typically have with companies um, as an aside. And then I think that the application specific blockchain space, um, I think Cosmos is uh, likely to sort of uh, be at the forefront of that. Uh, and I think, you know, long term, um, there's going to be Bitcoin. Um, I don't have a lot of optimism that there's going to be an, a robust application space on top of Bitcoin, which is going to challenge the application spaces we have everywhere else in crypto right now. Um, and then I think that in terms of, you know, uh, general purpose layer ones, um, to me, I think Solana is the one to beat. Uh, and then I think the application space, uh, application specific blockchain space, um, there are reasons that you'd want to have an app chain over just building on a general purpose L1. Uh, I think there's, you know, very good and rational reasons for that to happen. And I think that's likely to take place in Cosmos. Yeah, fantastic. So, so I'm interested in, you know, yeah, um, we've had some really, really interesting speakers the past three days. Um, you know, I, w one thing that stood out to me was we had Gavin um, Birch, who, um, who's at Figment, and he was talking about how, you know, how everything is so uh, current, right, in this space. Everything is always okay. being developed. Things are new. Um, I think his quote was something like, you know, we're kind of imagining it along the way. And I kind of love that, but it's also a, probably a bit, you know, for the right person, that's really insightful, and for the you know for someone else, that could be scary. Um, so you know, in in your trajectory, I guess my, my question is, you know, how how have you you know brought on developers that were in the Web two space into Web three, and, and have you had those kinds of direct interactions and in, and in, in, you know and in, in yeah. kind of having to convince people, hey, no, look, you know, <laughs> these are you know from a technology perspective, this is this is really really groundbreaking stuff, right? This is you can get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of curious about that that. Um, yeah, that dialogue you've had. Yeah, um, I think that um, it's uh, the direction of movement is pretty clear. And I think there are a few things that are driving that. Um, one is that uh, there's more uh, line of sight to why crypto matters, that it's not going to, you know, it's not going to either, you know, uh, disappear because of its own malpractice or it's not going to get, you know, uh, disintegrated by regulators or whatever. So there's a degree of de-risking in the space, and then I think the applications that can be built within uh, within crypto these days are also uh, people understand why they're cool and potentially different, right? And potentially even better than the way we do it today. And so, when you think about, for example, broadly speaking, a social network, uh, one where all of your information is owned by a uh, by a large company versus one where you own all of your own data. I think most people can understand why that's interesting as an example. Um, and so I think that that's becoming more clear. Um, I also think that um, the uh, the maturity of the tooling and the developer experience has been improving. Uh, a few years ago to be writing smart contracts was almost entirely in Solidity and people have different opinions about Solidity in terms of its security. It's, you know, just as a as a programming language, right, it's, uh, it's robustness over time for different types of applications. Uh, and I think that's an ongoing discussion. What I've noticed more recently is that um, there seems to be quite a bit of convergence into Rust. Uh, Solana is Solana uses Rust, Cosmosm is Rust. Uh, Gear Network is um, a new one uh, in Polkadot, which is also Rust oriented. And then Near as well, which uh, from what I understand is probably the number one developer experience within sort of Web3, uh, they're also Rust-based. Uh, so the common narrative that at least I hear these days is, um, well, Solidity is uh, fairly accessible, uh, and most people who've gone in the space are, uh, did it through Solidity. So how do we convert those developers into other ecosystems? I think that's one way, one potential way of looking at it. But I think the bigger um, sort of pie, if you will, is, uh, is Web2 developers um, who might off, might actually already be sort of writing in Rust. Um, and it's actually, I think, easier to convert a developer familiar with Rust into, for example, a building in Cosmosm than it is to take a Solidity developer and have them convert over to a Cosmosm mindset. Um, and so my opinion is that it's probably more worthwhile to sort of focus a developer acquisition funnel, if you will, 
um, on acquiring Web2 developers than converting a Solidity developer. Right, yeah, well, there are definitely a lot more of them. <laughs> yes, there are a lot more Currently. of them, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's potentially sort of skill sets which are more um, adjacent to, you know, we hear all the time, oh, Rust is so hard, Rust is so hard. And in reality, a Solidity to Rust kind of, you know, up upskilling or reskilling, if you want to call it, is like six weeks, uh, which is actually not a huge barrier. So, uh, you know, it's not actually that hard. Um, is what I'm told. So, but you know, I'm speaking as someone who's not a developer myself. Just you know, what, what I've been told. So. Yeah. No. No. That's great. Yeah. I. I. I'm at, you know. I. You, you. I think you've touched on this a little bit already. But I, I'm curious. You know. Again, a lot of this audience. Um. You know. Might. Might be more traditional Web two. Um. You know. Day to day and and looking at the opportunities in the Web three space. Um. And you know, one thing I've gotten asked after the event, or, or you know, in DMs or on Discord, whatever is uh you know there's there's a kind of a language and technology stack hurdle and then there's obviously the the industry hurdle right which is there's a lot of stuff people have to learn um that is just outside of language specific issues that um can be hurdles right for them yep. right staking validating you know what what yep. does it mean to delegate right how do how do nodes function how do i actually deploy on chain um you know and i'm, I'm I, I think my question around all of that is like, you know, how have you kind of broken that kind of uh, larger, you know, infrastructure pitch <laughs> to <laughs> to developers who say, well, you know, okay, Rust is an interesting, um, you know, uh, a gateway for me to get into Web3 or, or in Agoric's case, you know, we're obviously very focused on JavaScript um, yes. and, you know, those developers. Um, and, but, you know, there's still that challenge, right? There's still that kind of, <laughs> you know, that infrastructure hurdle, which is not just language or, or you know, um, language specific it's it's you know this is literally an entirely new industry so what yes. what are some of the things the challenges you've faced or you know how have you solved those and onboarding people into these projects you're involved with yeah i mean it is a huge amount of um uh, content and knowledge that I, I think it is somewhat impractical for uh, a single person to digest that in like a week right or even a month um there's uh so i think you kind of have to choose the area that interests you a bit and then sort of come in from that perspective. And so I think that there are some folks that get into it from the uh, from you know the validator side, uh, operating network infrastructure. I think that's a clear entry point for folks that maybe have background in uh, hardware systems engineering, uh, for example. Um, I think that for uh, for folks that are more on the application development side, then it's, you know, uh, what do you find to be interesting in the DeFi space or the, you know, call it DAO, Metaverse, NFT space, um, uh, like, uh, which is more, I guess, finance versus call it social. Um, so I think there's different entry points given kind of where people are starting. Um, and then uh, and then from there, usually, you know, as you kind of pull on the thread, uh, it's okay, well, uh, different chains uh, and diff have different communities. Um, where do I like the vibe of the community? Some, uh, there's also on the spectrum, um, some uh, communities which are more coordinated and others that are less, right? And those, um, both ends of that spectrum have trade-offs, their respective trade-offs. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think those are, for me, kind of some different ways of getting into it. Um, broadly speaking in crypto, um, the sort of, the funnels, if you will, from a kind of ecosystem building perspective, there's developer funnel, kind of user funnel, and then validator funnel in order to sort of, you know, build a network, right? Um, and so, uh, so you know, the developer funnel is clearly the most important one initially, because without developers, you don't have applications, users have nothing to do, um, which is a little bit uh, the challenge that some of the older chains have where, you know, XRP and XLM, really just a token, they don't have smart contracting. And so, uh, and so the application space on top of those ecosystems is a little bit stalled right now because what are you going to do, right? Um, and uh, it's very difficult for those chains to interact with others uh, because it's really hard to have uh, bridging or cross-chain, you know, messaging or any of that sort of compatibility without smart contracting. So um, that's, uh, um, that's, you know, kind of on the developer side uh, in order to actually have applications for users to come and do something, right? For me, that's always been uh, why crypto becomes interesting because it enables this entirely sort of new 
um, class of applications um, that offer new functionality just to regular people, right? So uh, money that moves faster and you know 24/7 rather than waiting on the wire system to kind of wake up and you know got to get it in by 229 Pacific if you want to pay your supplier in Asia type of thing, right? Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, uh, and that's like a very simple one that's been articulated um, many, many times over. Uh, and then another one that's been articulated many times is, wouldn't it be great if you could own your data? Yes, I know we all uh, click on those terms and service where Facebook where Meta tells you that you actually own your data, but you know, practically speaking, we know what's going on, right? Right. Uh, so, uh, so that's you know another one that's been articulated many times. Uh, but then some of the other ones, which I think are coming into focus, is well, wouldn't it be really interesting if you know people not just have these chains, but that really what they are, there's communities and the governance aspect of that's really fascinating. And what does that mean when the people who use an application are actively involved in the governance of that application, which has an economic component to it? And when you put all of that together, you know, it's actually kind of an internal economy and that's really crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, um, anyways, I, I I know you probably have your next speaker, um, but uh, and I'm sorry if that wasn't terribly about infrastructure and tooling, but uh, um, no, it's, no, no, it's it, it, it's great. No, it's an amazing introduction to it because I think there's a lot of um, you know you've clearly laid out laid out a lot of areas that I know our next speaker uh, Nader will I'll let himself uh, I'll let him introduce himself in a second, but this is this is great, Lily. Thank you, thank you for yeah. your time today. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. Yep. And yeah, and if uh, I'm assuming the best way for people to reach out is Twitter, probably. Uh, yeah, no problem. I'm obviously have me on Twitter here, and um, I have DMs open. I always do. So, yeah. Amazing. Okay. Thank, Thank you so me. much, Lily. Thanks Thank so much, you. guys. Okay.